not so many months ago, most of us, if not all, received some gifts, Christmas gifts. How were they wrapped? In paper of red or green or gold? Wound up as shiny ribbons, topped with satiny bows? What did it feel like to open those gifts? Chances are you didn't know what was inside of those boxes or gift bags. There was that moment of curiosity. Pick it up, shake it, feel its weight. Then came the cutting of the ribbon, the tearing of the paper, the opening of the cardboard flaps. What a joy to discover how much someone loves us, loves us enough to offer a gift. Ask yourself a question, though. How would you feel if as you have opened your gift, the giver were to say to you, let me have that for a moment, you hand it over. You know, that's a really nice present. I, I'd like to have it for myself. I, th I think I'll keep it. We used to have a, a word for that kind of person back when I was a kid. We called them an Indian giver. Few of us realized at the time that, that Indian giver is a rather offensive racial slur. Anyone who spent any time with Native Americans know that the generosity is deeply ingrained in their culture. Guests were accorded with warm hospitality. In the potlatch ceremony, a tribal tradition in the Pacific Northwest, the host gives themselves poor, making sure their guests walk away, their guests walk away with more than, than they need. So, so where did that expression come from, that Indian giver expression? Well, it arose on the western frontier in, in confused and chaotic times when settlers from European backgrounds were pushing their way west into native lands. Those were communal cultures, those native tribes. They didn't have the same understanding of ownership as did the settlers. Very few things in the native culture were considered personal property of, of individuals. Most belonged to the tribe. If somebody took a hanker into something you were carrying around, you'd pr probably give it to them, knowing that the favor would be returned at some point if you got the hanker for something they had. As for real estate, nobody owned any land. It all belonged to everyone in the tribe. Even when the European settlers came to uh, purchase some property for like grazing their their horses, the, the native inhabitants didn't quite get the concept. They thought that the gifts that were given were just that, gifts. When the natives returned a few months later to graze their horses on that same land, the European people assume they were just reneging on the bar on the bargain and that's that's the unfortunate way that that uh, racially offensive terribly inaccurate label Indian giver came about the Europeans thought that the gifts they received from the Native Americans had strings attached all of it had strings attached when in fact there were no strings at all because everybody still Everything still belonged to everyone. That might seem to be a long way to travel to get to where we finally want to get to, and that's the scripture from 1 Corinthians 12. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For the common good is the phrase we're going to focus in on. What does it mean in this day and age to hold something for the common good? 
So much of what we own is held individually. Every time we walk into a store to buy something, we come out not only with that item we purchased, but also a little slip of paper we call a receipt that, that proves that we own that said item. For bigger items such as cars or houses or boats, we have fancier pieces of paper called titles or, or deeds. If we finish a course of study at a school or university, we're given a diploma to hang on our wall. Proof that we truly do own that little piece of knowledge that we've spent so much time, money, and effort acquiring. As for money itself, we've got whole institutions, including banks, whose sole purpose is to keep track of who owns what. We're so into ownership in our culture that even we want to own the things we've given away, and that's why you have all those little black brass plaques on things that remind the world who is the one that gave that gift. And then there's those, those engraved pavers. I don't know if you've seen these. They, these are little bricks set into the ground outside schools and libraries and, and churches. Each one telling the story of the gift a donor has made. The donor doesn't expect any money back, of course, but, but they do like the idea that there's a little string attached to the gift by which anyone so inclined to trace it can trace it back to them. We also have uh, profession, professionals who um, have in the past and still, I think, do give some time to the common good. Attorneys call it pro bono work, pro bono meaning for good. And uh, they take on clients for social service organizations or, or just for the, the, uh, for the needy. Doctors have done the same thing over the years, um, taking on patients they knew couldn't pay or, or they would pay in farm produce or whatever uh, over the years. And, and professionals still do donate a large amount of time in this way, um, but it seems to be getting fewer and farther between. Not only that, people aren't joining bowling leagues anymore. Now, there's a transition you didn't see coming, did you? It's been a major issue that has confronted the sport for at least two decades, maybe more. Proprietors used to have uh, the ability to, to depend upon 80 to 90 percent of their income coming from the bowling leagues, and now it's down to about 45 and 55 percent if you're lucky. It seems that the manufacturer of beer and pretzels have also noticed this certain drop-off in profits from the bowling alley. Faced with such a problem as that, they did what any self-respecting executive would do. They commissioned a study. The study revealed that fewer Americans were joining bowling leagues, that, it, that it's not the people aren't bowling any longer. They're just not joining leagues. The, American public is bowling in smaller groups now on a more informal basis. Now, aren't you glad you got to hear these wonderful facts? Well, apparently, continuing on these wonderful facts, the, the beer and pretzel barons have known for a long time that the bowling league members buy more refreshments than do casual bowlers. So they knew they were face to face with a very serious problem, so they expanded the study the study further identified a much larger trend affecting American society, a general tendency for the people not to affiliate with groups of any kind, not to be joiners these days. And we've experienced this trend in our civic organizations, our volunteer fire halls, our churches, many of the groups that might be under the category of for the common good. We're such individualistic individualists that we're too individualistic for our own individual good sometimes. That's so much different from the spiritual gift Paul speaks about in 1 Corinthians 12, gifts that were meant to be used for the common good. And it's quite a list. I mean, 
Uh, some of them make more sense to a first century church than they do to the church today. But even so, it's a very impressive list. There's, there's an old story about a guy who walked into a church when it was being constructed, and he, he walked up to one of the workers and he asked him, what are you doing? And the, look, the, the, look, the worker looked up at him and was like, I'm sawing a board, can't you see that? It's okay, and he went on to the second worker and he said, what are you doing? And the second worker also looked him in the eye and he said, well, I'm, I'm building a pew. So okay, wonderful. And he went to the next worker he found, and he said, "What are you, what are you doing?" And he looked at the man very, very thoughtfully and said, "Well, I'm d building a cathedral to the glory of God." Now, there's a man who understands how his work contributes to the common good. What about you? What about the gifts or talents you have? your knack for organizing, your singing voice, your head for figures, your skill with a hammer, your understanding of computers, your listening ear, that special way you have of putting a meal together or mediating a disagreement or filling out a tax return, comforting a child. These are all gifts from God as well, gifts of the Spirit. God gives us, gives us gifts, but but there is a string attached. Paul tells us that the gifts are given for the common good. Yes, we can, we can take pleasure in the gift. We can, we can enjoy the gift. And we can even feel proud that we have the gift. Yet at the end of the day, that, that great long day that is our lives, God is going to ask us to provide a reckoning. Those gifts of ours, how did we use them? Did we use them just for our own benefit alone? Or for the, the, the good of the larger community? What's the point is, what, not what gifts we take to the grave, but what, what gifts we give away. The world, my friends, is, is one great giveaway. The Lord has given us everything we have and everything we are. Stand on the mountaintop, look around. Everything as far as your eye can see is God's gift. You, you can take a little piece of that creation, slap a sign on it and say, it's mine, say it's mine. But it's really not. We can pretend it's ours, but really it all belongs to God. Always has, always will. It belongs to God and it's all there for the common good. God's gifts, you see, always and forever have strings attached. Yet they're not this kind of strings that can yank the gift away from us. Rather, they connect us to one another in community and to God for the common good. All of this is the work of the Holy Spirit. We call these things the gifts of the Spirit, which means you never open such a gift without being changed within for the common good. The grace of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.